Muito bom dia a todos e ficamos felizes de ver a casa com tanta gente às nove da manhã. É, eu, é uma honra, então, receber a professora Cristina Turin, que vem da Universidade de St. Andrews, da Escócia, falar para a gente. E ela é, fez uma pesquisa de campo do, nas ilhas Fiji e tem algumas monografias, a primeira... É, chama Making History. E Making History? Deixa eu ver aqui. Making History. The significance of hierarchy. Yes, the significance of hierarchy in Fiji. And then she's got this Mind, Materiality and History Explorations in Fijian Ethnography uh, with some. Desculpa, gente. E com alguns, algumas, alguns textos, alguns artigos, é, que é uma coletânea. E a professora Cristina Torren tem também vários artigos em inglês e em português disponíveis é, na internet. Então, é, eu gostaria de mencionar o Como Sabemos o que é Verdade, o caso do Mana em Fiji, que está na revista Mana, disponível na internet. Recentemente saiu também... A matéria da imaginação, o que podemos aprender com as ideias das crianças fijianas sobre suas vidas como adultos, saiu na Horizontes Antropológicos, de 2010, também disponível na internet. E há um livro em que, ela, que ela organizou, em que ela tem uma participação também, organizado com o João de Pina Cabral e o Fernando Gil, que chama O Processo da Crença. Então, é, a gente gostaria de, de contar que havia disponível alguns, obrigada, alguns textos em português, para quem se interessar em conhecer a obra dela. Né? É, eu gostaria de finalizar mencionando que esse trazer a Cristina Turing foi um esforço conjunto do Museu Nacional do Rio de Janeiro, da Universidade de São Paulo, da Universidade de Campinas, a Unicamp, e na Universidade Federal de São Carlos, e nós pudemos contar, então, com o financiamento da FAPESP, a quem a gente agradece, e com essa hospedagem aqui pela Ampox, né, e esse espaço que a Ampox fornece para essa conferência. Eu passo a palavra para a Cristina Turing, que tem um trabalho a apresentar é, e que é, deve contar para a gente melhor sobre o trabalho dela, do que a gente poderia falar. Então, muito obrigada a todos. Obrigada, Alice. Can everybody hear me? Is that okay? Um, I have to begin by a thanking um, my invitees. Thank you to Professor Simoish and to uh, my colleague uh, Clarice Cohn. Um, and also I want to apologize for inflicting on you a very heavy duty, rather dense um, paper this morning. I normally write the kind of ethnography that engages people with its charming, you know, sort of aspects. This is not that kind of paper, I'm warning you, okay? But, on the other hand, I do think that it's necessary to do these kinds of papers now and again, and this is one of them. Okay, so I shall fire away, and if you manage to... Um, have the patience to stay with me until the end, you're very welcome to um, ask questions and so on. And I think the paper will take just about uh, an hour, perhaps a bit under. Anthropologists who work at the interface of psychology and anthropology are by and large committed to anthropology as science. The problem for us, however, is that the institutional development of the human sciences in the late 19th and early 20th centuries effectively allotted different aspects of what it is to be human to different disciplines. Faced with separate epistemological domains of anthropology, psychology, sociology, linguistics, philosophy, and biology, Scientists in the latter half of the 20th century found themselves having to work hard to put the pieces back together again, body and mind, for example. As is often the case, however, new subdisciplinary domains intended to overcome conceptual difficulties served rather to entrench them. 
The 1970s saw the invention of psychological anthropology. The 1980s brought us cultural psychology. In the 1990s, we rediscovered the body and phenomenology, and at the same time witnessed the resurgence of cognitive anthropology, which, during the first decade of the 21st century, would appear to dominate the field, contributing to the development of what is today called cognitive science. Whether, over coming decades, cognitive anthropology will continue to dominate our understanding of mind, will have everything to do with the extent to which anthropology as an intellectual project is able to realize and come to grips with the real political implications of the ahistorical concept of human being that lies at its heart. The argument put forward in the present paper is explicitly opposed to cognitivist models because of their inability to come to grips with human historical actuality in general and their own historical nature in particular. Thus, for all the often fascinating work that has been done in the various subfields of anthropology, and despite the explosion of knowledge in other subdisciplinary domains, neurobiology and neuroscience, for example, the interface between anthropology and psychology continues to throw into relief a question that remains fundamental to the human sciences, including anthropology. How are we to conceive of human beings? The answer we give to this question is important because it structures not only what we currently know about ourselves and others, but what we are capable of finding out. Now, as will become apparent, the recognition of our historical nature provides for a resolution of debates concerning the relative validity of representational, social constructivist, and neurophenomenological models of mind. This paper proposes a unified model of human being whose manifold aspects remain entirely open to investigation, even while the model is intended to deal at once with the uniqueness, that is to say, the historical actuality of what it is to be human, and with critical issues at the interface of psychology and anthropology, and, in so doing, prove to be a rigorous, explanatory, robust model of what it is to be human. Okay, the next section is called a unified model of human being. What are the crucial aspects of such a model? Fundamentally, that its object be conceived of at the outset as living and as human, not as an information processing device. This model starts with human physical actuality, the fact that each one of us, like other living things, is biologically speaking autopoietic, self-creating, self-regulating. A newborn baby, infant or young child requires other humans to look after its primary needs, making its ontogeny a social process. Indeed, as living systems that are human, each and every one of us needs others if we are to maintain our autonomy over the course of our own lives and contribute to the lives of others. There is nothing paradoxical about this. Rather, it is given to us as human beings that the particular nature of our autonomy resides precisely in the history of our relations with one another. Or to put it another way, our uniqueness in every single case is given in the fact that each one of us has a personal history that makes us who we are. Our propensity for making sense of the environing world is a crucial aspect of human being. It follows that making sense, or in other words, learning, is a dynamic, spatio-temporal process that at any given point inevitably locates humans historically 
in relation to particular others, in particular places, at particular times in the peopled world. Or to put it another way, any given human is, in every aspect of his or her being, the dynamic transforming product of the past he or she has lived and is, at any given time, placed in relation to all those others, young and old, living and dead, whose ideas and practices are contributing to structure the conditions of his or her present existence. Any given human here means any fetus, neonate, infant, child, adolescent, adult, or old person. Because autopoiesis, self-creation, self-regulation, is a process that begins at conception and ends only with death. We can think of ourselves, therefore, as living and manifesting the historical processes that engage us in literally every aspect of our being. For example, whether we consider the matter statistically, in population terms, or personally, our physical makeup is the dynamic product of a, a particular biosocial history, which for all its possible complications and convolutions could in principle be traced back over many generations. Likewise, the languages we speak, likewise our ideas of what is or could be in the world and our means for finding out. This personal history is continuous with our evolutionary species history. In the unified model, mind is a function not of the brain, nor of the embodied nervous system, but of the whole human being in intersubjective relations with others in the environing world. Now, implicit is a view of consciousness as an aspect of human autopoiesis. Here, consciousness cannot be a domain or a level of psychological functioning. Rather, consciousness is that aspect of mind that posits the existence of the thinker and the conceptual self-evidentiality of the world as lived by the thinker. Intersubjectivity is shorthand for, I know that you are another human like me, and so I know that you know that because I am human, I know that you are too. It is this capacity for recursive thought that makes human learning, here intended in its broadest sense, a micro-historical process. Our intersubjective relationship to one another is always bound to be historically prior because whenever we encounter one another, we do so as carriers of our own, always unique history. I make sense of what you are doing and saying in terms of what I already know. Any and all experience is assimilated to my existing structures of knowing. This goes for everyone, newborn babies and geriatric patients included. Making sense of the peopled world is a material, self-organizing process that at once transforms new experience in the course of its assimilation and to this extent conserves what I already know and transforms my existing structures of knowing in the course of their accommodation to new experience and to this extent changes what I know. Now in this view, the human being whose ideas and practices we are trying to understand and explain is social through and through. And the world of people and things that this human inhabits crucially informs his or her entire constitution, specifically the continuing constitution over time of those processes we call mind. It follows that there is no aspect of anyone's humanity that is not historically constituted. At any given time, when one acts on the world in any way at all, one's understanding of the world, oneself and one's relations with other humans are all informed by one's previous history. That is to say, one's history up to that moment. The unified model takes for granted 
that intersubjectivity is emotional, that perceiving and feeling are aspects of one another, and that intentionality is given in an openness towards and a felt engagement in the peopled world. Here, learning and teaching are aspects of the self-same process. Throughout our lives, our active engagement in the world of people and things effects continuing differentiation of the processes through which we know what we know. The processes of mind are subject as much to change as to continuity, but as we grow older, they become progressively less subject to radical change, precisely because they are already highly developed. The longer they have been functioning to assimilate information, the more highly differentiated they already are, the less radically they can transform as a function of accommodation to new situations. Thus, the unified model bears on humans as living. Now, understanding our biological substance is crucial to understanding not only our physical, but our psychological makeup. It makes a difference whether the phenomena of mind are conceived of as neurophenomenological processes or as computational programs. Now, more of this uh, below. For the moment, it's important just to realize that however sophisticated a computer may be, it does not bring itself into being by virtue of differentiation over time of its own physical substance. Our present knowledge, of course, leaves a great deal to be desired, but even so, we understand enough of autopoiesis as a biological process to realize that logically, it has to be applied not only to the physiological dimension of human being, but also to those processes we call mind. Now, the next section is called the problem with cultural models. The processes through which we know the peopled world, like the neurological processes of which they are an aspect, are likewise autopoietic characterized by continuing differentiation through functioning. Now, once we understand this, it becomes obvious that information processing or representational models of mind cannot capture its inherent dynamics. Take, for example, schema theory, as found in various forms in cognitive anthropology. The idea of the schema as mental representation took hold in cognitive anthropology in the 1980s and was incorporated in the 1990s into connectionist neural network models of psychological functioning. Connectionist models of mind attempt to make computational theory consistent with what we know of the workings of the human brain. They employ an idea of parallel distributed processing that allows for a cognitive scheme that is always emergent, never quite fixed, and thus provide for a model of how cognitive processes respond to their own environment and are modified by it. Nevertheless, as representation, and as a component of the more complexly figured, configured cultural model. The schema that figures in works by Holland and Quinn, Dan Drady, and Shaw, to take several well-known examples, is peculiarly static. Shaw's attempt to distinguish between conventional models and personal models manifests neatly the problem with the schema as representation idea of mental processes. Because the schemas that compose cultural models are conceived of as mirroring mental representations of the world inside the human head, Shaw's cultural model cannot intrinsically allow for the fact that insofar as we understand and embrace what is conventional, we do so as particular people with particular histories. From which it follows that for any one of us, the conventional and the personal 
are aspects of one another, an artifact of the self-same process. And the continuity over time is likewise an aspect of transformation. Now, if this idea of continuity in transformation sounds odd, just try thinking about yourself, your whole person, including your ideas about the world, as a dynamic system of transformations. Aging, for example, is one aspect of the workings of this dynamic system. So is digestion, and so is reading a book or having a conversation. You remain autonomously yourself, even though from moment to moment and year to year, your continuity through time is that of a dynamically transforming system. Now, the problem with a representational model of mind that mirrors objectively given properties of the world did not go away with the development in the 1990s of cultural psychology. Schweder, however, did his best to move anthropologists away from what he characterized as the platonic impulse, the presumed mind to be a fixed and universal property of the psyche. He found support both in the idea that, quote, the mind is embodied in concrete representations, in mediating schemata, scripts, and well-practiced tools for thought, unquote and, of course, in the idea of culture, which he characterized as, quote, that part of the scheme that is inherited or received from the past, unquote. The problem is that the implicit distinction between culture and biology and the representational information processing model of mind on which Schwader's account depends render his project incoherent, internally contradictory, and unrealizable. Like other theories of this kind, it has recourse to social construction in an attempt to explain the differences between intentional worlds, specifically, uh, for example, between American and Indian ideas of the person. But social construction itself depends on an historically constituted idea of the person as an individual in society who interacts with other individuals to negotiate their respective ideas about an objectively given world. Quote, the constructive parts of a social construction theory are the idea that equally rational, competent, and informed observers are, in some sense, free to constitute for themselves different realities, and that there are as many realities as the way it can be constituted or described. The social parts of a social construction theory are the idea that categories are vicariously received not individually invented, and are transmitted, communicated, and passed on through symbolic action. That's from Schweder in 1991. Now, in locating the constructive process in the person, and what is social in an abstract space between persons, in language categories, for example, Social constructionists reproduce the very theoretical impasse they seek to dismantle. In the absence of an understanding that making sense of the peopled world is an historical process, Schweder cannot render analytical the categories he seeks to understand. Now, cultural construction, of course, fares no better, theoretically speaking, the idea that much, if not most, of what humans say and do is the product of cultural construction is a truism of contemporary cultural anthropology. Culture continues to be taken for granted as explanatory, even though such analytical distinctions as culture biology, society individual, mind body, structure process, and emotion rationality have long posed problems 
especially for psychological anthropologists. Now, ideas of cultural construction rest on the same problematic Cartesian distinctions as computational models of cultural meaning. The ubiquity of the terms is such that I can find, even in my own earlier work, a number of appearances of cultural and construction, and even cultural constructs. But it is not construction that bothers me so much. It's culture that is analytically empty.